welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast Midweek Supplemental Edition. Uh, my name is Bob DeMarco, and I am your host here today. And uh, today we're going to talk about a couple of new knife drops. We're going to get a story of acquiring quite a unique uh, ethnographic knife from a quite a unique location from my dad, who's going to roll in here for a, a special story. And then uh, we'll go over the state of the collection, where I talk about No New Knife November and how actually I've acquired quite a few knives during this no New Knife November, but it's through the generosity of viewers like you. And uh, so I want to I want to talk about that and show off some of that. Also, uh, just getting to appreciate uh, what's already in the collection and uh, think about trimming the fat. You know, that's a that's a re reoccurring theme here. And uh, it gets very little actual attention. It gets a lot of talk. So uh, hopefully during this November, which is creeping by, um, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what to, how to trim things down and make things a little more uh, sane around here. Uh, anyway, I want to uh, mention the town hall coming up. That's coming up this Saturday, November 14th, Saturday, November 14th, live on YouTube at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's noon Eastern Standard Time. What, nine Pacific? Uh, so join us. It's going to be the, the, uh, the usual format for the town hall that's been established over the last uh, three town halls, bunch of guests, big knife makers, knife makers who are, um, you know, raising, uh, turning heads in terms of their process, in terms of their product, whatever it is. And you have a chance to talk with them. We're going to have them on for 20 to 30 minutes and uh, we'll have a chance to talk with them. We're going to, we're going to interview them in their workspace. So you'll see a bit of where the magic happens and uh, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, engage with these people live, uh, whether it's through the comments or if you want to follow the link and come on, uh, come on screen for a few minutes and uh, ask questions of these fine folk. Uh, this time we have Lance Abernathy of Sniper Blade Works. We have Alex Steingraber, who is big with the steel junkies and the steel nerds because he's doing great things with uh, heat treating and using different steels. We have David Cam, you know him as Blade Banter on YouTube and Instagram, uh, but David has also started a knife company, Orion Knives. He's got the Solaris, uh, which has been doing the rounds and just getting great, uh, great press. And uh, by the way, we interviewed him here on this show. Great interview. Uh, if you want to hear about the whole process of going just from a knife uh, fan and collector to the owner of a knife company. Uh, who's doing it just right. Definitely check out that interview with David Cam. Uh, we have TJ Schwartz coming on, uh, acclaimed knife designer of the uh, of many CRKT knives, uh, chief among them recently, the Overland and the Periscale. And uh, what was the Caligo, Caligo a couple of years ago? Uh, that was his first uh, knife with CRKT, but he also designed the Koenig Arius, uh, which is, uh, well, it was a little known fact to me and uh, until I interviewed him. And he was like, oh yeah, by the way, I designed uh, you know, one of the hottest knives ever. And I was like, oh yeah, oh, I knew that. So anyway, uh, I have interviews with all these uh, all these guys. Check them out. Um, you can really, really dig into their craft and find out what, what keeps them going. Did I mention Ernest Emerson? Ernest Emerson will also be on the town hall. I think I was saying, saving him for last and then skipped over him. Uh, you know, big hero of mine, both in the knife making world, the martial arts world, and the you know, you can look at him in a lot of different ways and and get inspiration. Um, and so uh, Ernest Emerson will be on. He's also just a great guy and a great guy to talk to. So you'll have a chance to come on and speak with all these people. Uh, that's the town hall coming up this Saturday, November 12th at noon Eastern Standard Time. And uh, come join us. It'll be awesome. Uh, next, I just want to thank our patrons. Uh, uh, for a couple weeks now, I've been doing the, the hard sell at the beginning of the show. Please join Patreon, this and that. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, and instead of doing that now, I'm just going to thank the people who have already joined. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. And I just want to say, this is not part of a hard sell, but if you join at the $10 per month level, you're entered into a free monthly knife giveaway drawing. And I think that's why a lot of the people join at that level. Uh, we have, and I'm just going to mention, I know some of their last names, but if it's not uh, mentioned on Patreon, I'll say it exactly as it's uh, as it's listed. We have Brent, 
We have Where is Kristoff? We have Timothy Becker. We have Jock of Jock's Knives. We have Kevin Seastrom. We have Reed Martz, Caleb Townsend, Ryan Leitner, our good friend. We have Edwin Cal uh, Callow, also our good friend, and the Knife Whisperer. We have Joe, uh, Mike Latham, Jesse Tellis, Mr. Filato, Blade Ogre, and Fred Lynn. Now, you gents uh, all really make things here happen. We appreciate it. The money that, uh, that you put in uh, each month now has been going to uh, our server and, and other costs. Actually, a lot of it is sitting in the, in the, in the fund waiting to be spent on future uh, enhancements. Uh, this is not a form of income for me or Jim. This is a way to keep the knife junkie going. So thank you all, one and all uh, patrons. It's greatly appreciated. So uh, next, Let's find out what's new in the knife world. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Tickles me every time I hear, I, I hear him say, you are a dork. Terry Rounds, ladies and gentlemen. Love that guy. Uh, so I want to talk about the first uh, new knife. Now, there, you'll, you'll notice in these two stories, which are, are the two most recent stories from Knife News this week, um, you will notice a theme. And actually, this theme is concurrent with a theme you've heard on the Knife Junkie podcast recently, which is slip joint knives, non-locking uh, slip joint knives. The first one is from uh, Real Steel and our friend Ostop Hell. Uh, Ostop is a uh, knife designer from Poland, and uh, we have a great interview with him here on the show. Very interesting guy. And actually, you know, I'm always going off uh, talking about how the Russians have a very uh, particular look. I feel like I can identify a Russian designed knife. Well, that's happening now with uh, the Polish designed knives, too. I've, I've been noticing Ostapel has such a, uh, a unique style and a, and a very um, utilitarian and recognizable style. Um, and recently, uh, they have put, as uh, Benjamin Schwartz says over there at Knife News, uh, put the the uh, G-slip in front of a shrink ray. So the G-slip, which was, uh, which is a slip joint version of the, um, of the Metamorph, the, one of the greatest selling knives from uh, Real Steel. And, and if you ask me, one of the, one of the best knives out there, it's basically a, a slip joint version of the Metamorph with a, with a changed uh, blade slightly. Well, they've made that smaller and put it in a G10 package. And uh, now it's a three inch, well, just, just shy of three inches and non-locking slip joint form 14C28N and uh, with a little wire clip. And it's uh, it's legal basically everywhere. Everywhere you can own a blade that is approaching three inches uh, and non-locking, you can carry this. So uh, I really like it. And you know, as you know, it just, uh, it feeds into my current collecting mm, proclivities, if you will. Uh, but, but as you know, I, I shy away from the the modernized slip joints, though I have the uh, the gentleman jack from Medford, which I like a lot, and uh, and I have the uh, the the lion steel. What's that one called? The Gitano, great knife, uh, but all kind of modernized. I tend towards the older, uh, but maybe this Ostop Hell will will bring me out of that shell and and get me to appreciate some of these more modernized slip joints. So, Ostop Hell, another slip joint, real steel shrunken down G-slip. And now we move to Mikkel Willemsen, another famed uh, 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 designer. He's from Northern Europe. I can't remember what country, maybe Denmark. Sorry, uh, Mikkel. Uh, but he's got the uh, another new knife out that is world legal. Now, years ago, five years ago, maybe, uh, he designed a couple of slip joint knives for Sorry, I'm forgetting, but it's a it's more of a hardware brand than a knife brand, and they were called World Legal, and there are these big stout, um, stout but short um, slip joint knives that look kind of like utility knives. They were at home on the on the rack at Home Depot, uh, design wise. Well, you know, Mikkel Williamson's designs they are or urban tactical is how it's usually summed up. I think that's the name of one of his lines, uh, but heavily. Uh, contoured handles and, uh, you know, um, very ergonomically um, locked in handles and uh, big blades, big choils, broad uh, choils, broad blades. Well, he's taken that design language and, uh, well, 
shrunk it down, frankly, and put it in a non-locking version. Uh, he's made a few uh, of these uh, non-locking knives in the past, and they've been a little bit larger. I can't remember the name of it. The Red E, I believe it was. Oh, that's what this is, the Red E. Manaj, please excuse me, people. Uh, so many knife names and so many variations. But in any case, the Red E W L uh, is is stands for World Legal is a version that doesn't flip open. The Red E flipped open. It had the double ball bearing uh, system, where it's held closed and held open by two little ball bearings uh, uh, on a uh, on a little spring bar. Um, but it could still flip open. So it has a lot of the hallmarks of, of illegal knives, basically illegal in, in lots of places. So to make it world legal, indeed world legal, he had to shrink it down. Uh, but he maintains a lot. I mean, look at this thing. It looks like a great white shark. I think it's, it's very cool. Uh, but this one, it's only nail neck openable. So it's a definitely a two handed knife. Um, and that's a big part of making a knife world legal is, you know, non-locking, short blade, you need two hands to open it. And then pretty much you can carry that anywhere. Uh, I think they said 153 countries this is legal in. Um, anyway, 14C28N, uh, 2.76 inch blade, and uh, just good to go. So anyway, check it out, 70 bucks. Um, fits right into my slip joint thing. I don't know, maybe I'll go there. Modern slip joint, who knows? Who knows what happens when December rolls out? I have some ideas, and uh, I'm not sure which way I'm going to go. In any case, uh, let's dip out of uh, Knife Life News, and let's hear a story from my dad. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. So, No New Knife November is a lot about appreciating what's already in the collection, and... Uh, my father has has instilled a love uh, for of ethnographic knives in me just from the things he's brought back and my mom has brought back from the various trips they've done all around the world. Dad, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. It's great to have you on. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, no new knife November. I'm not buying any knives. Uh, people are gifting them to me, which is very nice. But also it's a chance to look through what I already have and really appreciate it and a lot of what I have is hanging on the walls behind me. And, and these are things, some of these are things that you've gotten for me. And one of them is this. And I want to talk, about, you have a great story about acquiring this knife. Uh, this is a, this is from Uzbekistan. And it's a pchal. Oh, hang on, hang on. Let me see. I, I, I got I to gotta look at the letters to pchak. It's a pchak. And if you look closely at it, it's got beautiful damascene. Damascene, Damascene steel. In cross section, it has that that ridge on top. It's like an I beam, so that it's very, very, very strong in a thrust, very rigid. Uh, but it tapers, you know. But it comes down into a very thin blade, very slicey blade. It's got a beautiful wooden handle, three pins. Mm -hmm. How did you come uh, to this knife, Dad? And uh, tell me the story of how you got out with it. Well, I was traveling in Central Asia uh, in 2007, and uh, this knife comes from uh, either Bukhara or Samarkand in Uzbekistan. I can't remember exactly which city, but I'm pretty sure that it's Bukhara. At any rate, our, our local guide who knew of my desire to pick up a knife for you, buy a knife for you, uh, found this uh, uh, he knew exactly where to go in some little back alley in Bukhara. And we uh, took these uh, these wending roads down into uh, the heart of the old city, places I probably wouldn't go without a guide. At any rate, we come up to this forge, and uh, the, uh, the the fellow who owns the place, who is the uh, who made the knife sitting outside playing chess. Well, I've been playing chess ever since I was probably about six years old. And I love the game. <clears throat> so I started kibitzing with him. Now he's, he speaks Uzbeki, I speak English, but our guide was able to translate back and forth. At any rate, uh, after he finished the game he was playing uh, with the fellow he was playing with, uh, he mentioned, um, why don't we play a game? So I sat down and played a game with him. 
we had several cups of tea. Uh, I ended up beating them, and uh, that probably added on to the price of the night. <laughs> a little bit. At any rate, we then went into the forge, and uh, I saw him making a couple of knives. It was uh, it was just great, a great great scene. Uh, the knife I got for you was had been already constructed. It was uh, among uh, several that were hanging on the wall, and that's it. So this is. Um, this happened in uh, Uzbekistan. The next country on the uh, on the list was Turkmenistan. <clears throat> and the way you kind of travel between these countries isn't exactly the way you do it in the first world. Uh, what we did is we went up to uh, uh, a the TSA type shack at the end of Uzbekistan, <laughs> crossed over about a uh, half a football length field of no man's land with barbed wire on each side dragging our suitcases and went from Uzbekistan into Turkmenistan. Well, I was in Turkmenistan about uh, three or four days. And then uh, as we were ready to leave, um, I knew that I had to get your knife back home. <laughs> and uh, heretofore, I've been carrying it in my uh, travel bags and um, but I had to put it in uh, our suitcase for going home so I got in the suitcase and at the airport the uh, local TSA guy uh, or what passes for TSA in Turk in Ashgabat Turkmenistan um, <laughs> noticed that the x-ray showed this knife in there so even though it was check on baggage he wanted uh, he made uh he made me open up the suitcase and took out the knife and was looking at it uh, and was looking very unhappy. <laughs> and uh, I knew it was going to happen. And interestingly, our, our tour guide who was with us throughout this whole trip was this tough little gal. She was half Chinese, half Russian. She spoke Chinese, spoke Russian. She spoke, spoke a million Central Euro, uh, Central Asian dialects, and she corralled this guy, and took him and the knife into the back room, and then in about I didn't know what was going to happen. About five minutes later, she burst out of the room and said, "Okay, hurry up, hurry up, take this knife, put it in your suitcase, lock the suitcase, let's go, put it on the, put it on the, uh, uh, put it away. We're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna go," and. Um, that was the end of it. I mean, we got back to Azerbaijan, then back to Germany, then back to the U.S., and your knife was indeed there. But uh, what happened, obviously, is the way a lot of things happen throughout a lot of the third world is bakshish, which means a tip. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> undoubtedly, I, I, I tipped this lady very, very nicely because I knew what she had done. And that's, that's the way you got your knife back there, Rob. I love it. I love that story. And uh, just, you know, when you look at the map, you realize Central Asia, like this is this is probably some sort of modernized version of the kind of thing the Khans were carrying on them and the and and all of the conquering hordes. You know, this is this is the kind of knife that comes from that part of the world. That's why I was in Central Asia. I'm a big Genghis Khan fan. fan. And I love to travel through the areas that he hoarded and his hordes uh, devastated back in the early 1200s. Only, only so, with centuries of distance can you call yourself <laughs> a Genghis Khan fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Dad, uh, thank you uh, for coming on and telling this story. I, I like immortalizing it because I love that story. To me, I, I love the uh, the visual of you sitting down and playing chess with this guy because I know how frustrating it, it can be to play chess with you. And then and then going in and buying the knife, seeing the forge, and then getting out through uh, through bribery and sleight of hand. And, yeah. and, and here it is in my wall, you know. Yeah. So I, I love this thing. And and it is one of my, <clears throat> maybe one of two Damas uh, Damascus blades, and it's so beautiful. So anyway, thanks, Dad. Thanks for coming on. And okay, we're going to have you on for, for another story sometime soon. Okay, thank you. All I'm right. happy to come back. Awesome. Take care, Dad. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? 
Shop at theknifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at theknifejunkie.com slash books. Well, having my dad on to tell the story of this knife really does come from um, looking into what I have and, and, and slowing down and appreciating it. And uh, also, it's good to think about what compels you and why. Um, this has a great story behind it. Also, to me, it's, uh, you know, historically, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting piece. Uh, like I mentioned before, this could be the kind of thing the Huns were, or the, uh, the conquering hordes were carrying on them in Central Asia. Just, just cool to slow down and look at what else I have instead of being so acquisitive all the time. Um, that being said, uh, No New Knife November uh, has been very... Um, well, I've gotten a lot of knives, um, but none of them have I paid for, uh, and 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 none of them did I did I even ask for. Uh, the other day, I came home from work, and I saw a box, and uh, I picked it up, and it was heavy. I was like, "Geez, what is this? Gee whiz, what is this?" So uh, I I recognized the name. It's a, a fan of the show, and uh, I opened it up, and he sent me six Rough Rider knives, and you know me and the slip joints lately and uh and the value i find in rough rider knives um for experimenting with different patterns and uh checking out different handle materials and such and uh this gent sent me six of them and i just want to show them to you real quick uh one is a knife in a pattern i don't have yet this is the first one this is a muskrat uh muskrat is a um in a, a uh, well, in this case, a serpentine, but an equal-ended knife that has two blades, and it's uh, always a uh, uh, two two clip point blades. These kind of muskrat or Turkish or California clip point blades, and it has sort of a faux turquoise handle, and uh, and these kind of fancy bolsters. So very, very, <laughs> very cool, very nice in a pattern I've been interested in checking out. Of course, I've been talking a lot about the elephant toenail knives slash sunfish knives and uh he sent me a marbles which marbles is a kind of a parallel brand to rough rider i believe i i think i think they they come out of the same factory they're owned by the same people something like that but this one is in this beautiful green jigged bone that kind of looks like stag the way they jigged it um very fond of this knife and uh this uh this pattern and this particular specimen right here has fantastic action so very happy with that uh he sent a barlow a beautiful red bone jig boned barlow uh, these are all in 440a steel so they get super sharp very quickly they keep a decent edge but you know if you're going to be working hard all day you're going to have to strop it up uh bolster some people think this is too many notes with the with the large large bolster the the stamp and the and the uh, shield there but I say bring it. Why not? This one is cool. You know those little uh, lady leg knives? Well, he sent me a large lady leg knife in um, tortoiseshell. Big fan of tortoiseshell. And yeah, that's an almost four inch blade. Uh, I, I would definitely carry this. Pull it out and happily be like, yeah, look at my lady leg knife. I don't care. I'm secure enough in my masculinity to carry a lady leg knife. And then the last one is really cool. It's a lock back and it's in uh it's really well constructed i i i have to say uh, this is a rough rider lock back these are all rough rider r i d e r that means they're a little bit older rough rider started out spelling it with a y r y d e r they went to rider with an i and then they went back to the original some i don't, I don't know what the timing was but these are all with the i uh so this is a beautiful bone handle you got that rifle shield which uh, is pretty intricate for a, for an inlay. You can see a little bit of gapping around it, but it's filled in with epoxy. Who cares? Uh, very, I, I like that sort of machine ground swedge and um, just a nice knife and a very, very uh, decent lockback. I'm usually a little bit uh, suspicious of cheap lockbacks, I gotta say. But this one is, a, and by cheap, I mean inexpensive. This one does not feel cheap. I know it was inexpensive and, uh, it's a great knife. I, I would. So in, in any case, you know who you are. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to me. It's uh, 
whoops, let me move this light. It's a great, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take these for you. Uh, the last one you sent me though is by far my favorite. And uh, let me just show that real quick and then we will move, move along. Oh, look at this. Very much into the Stockman pattern recently. I love this pattern. I love the history of it. You know, like a cattle driving or cattle droving. Is that the right word? Uh, knife. And uh, the ideal version of this to me would be, would have a, an awl on it as well. Or, or instead of the, maybe instead of the spade blade. But anyway, it's in this beautiful, I don't know if that's sculpted bone to look like stag, but I have a couple of sculpted bone to look like stag knives by, by Rough Rider. And you can see the machine marks when you look closely. I can't see any in this. So I'm not sure if this is real stag or not. I'm going to ask the gentleman who, who gave this to me. But wow, what a, what, a, what a great gift. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A, and thank you for listening and watching. B. All right. So before we wrap, I want to talk about a knife, a couple of new knives, not new knives, a couple of knives I've rediscovered. Uh, during this. Uh, chief among them uh, has been the ZT-0200. Now, uh, this is a Ken Onion design. This is an early ZT. Uh, and I really, really wanted this knife so badly for a long time. It was it was out of way out of my reach in terms of price when it came out. And, uh, you know, it was not, it, it was just not something I could do and always, always wanted it. Well, years later, my brother ended up getting one. And a uh, few years after that, it was Christmas time and I was hanging out with him and, and I asked him if I could see it because I knew he had it. He brought it out and he gave it to me right on the spot. That's the kind of man my brother is. He's very generous and he's, well, he's a great guy. And he's, he has added to my knife collection in, in a way that is just invaluable over the years. Thank you, Vic. Uh, so he gave me this, but the thing I want to talk about is how spectacular this knife is. This is this is the this is what people think of when they think of ZT DNA. Um, what I mean is what's at the core of ZT, that sort of giant hard use knife. And when I look at the new uh, uh, 0308, it's definitely reminiscent of this and, and the 300 series and a little less of the um, svelte kind of Sinkovici designs they've been putting out. And I'm not dissing on Sinkovich. I think he's one of the greatest, but um, you look at this knife and and it's got a contoured handle in that direction. It's got like a little Coke bottle swell for the hands. Um, it's very big and fat and hand filling and milled so intricately and beautifully. Um, so yeah, this knife uh, is eight ounces. I mean, this this is not, or seven and seven eighths ounces, I guess. And it is almost three quarters of an inch thick. So I mean, it's a big, it's a beast, but uh, I am so happy I have this in my collection uh, because to me it represents, well, not only a very, very beautiful knife. Cause I mean, look at the shape of that blade. I love that recurve, but it also represents a time uh, in modern knife making that, uh, you know, when this came out, it was kind of the, the beginning, the beginning of the second wave, let's say post Terzawola, post Emerson, post, uh, uh, all of those. This was, this was sort of the, the hardcore folding hard use tactical knife coming to the masses. And, uh, that's what that represents to me. So I'm glad I have it in my collection as, as kind of a snapshot in time, but also as a, Reminder of my brother and also a reminder of how awesome Ken Onion's designs are. Look at that thing. So cool. Uh, another two that that have jumped out at me. This old, old SOG. I bought it in 1991 at a knife store in Boston, which I'm sure is not there anymore. <laughs> I would bet my I would bet a lot on it. But what a great and solid knife this little thing is, man. This is when SOG, this is before. Sog cheesed out and you know, Sog has come back and now they're making really great stuff like this, but this, this is in their DNA. This looks just like the, you know, it's like a small folding version of the, um, Mac Sog V or Mac V Sog knife. So this has been a great one to rediscover. Um, it is semi-traditional, semi-modern and made before a lot of you were born probably. <laughs> and, uh, it's very cool to have 
just back in the pocket. I find it took me like 25 years to get an edge on it though. It came dull as hell and I didn't have the sharpening chops until recently and got it, got it done. And then, and then uh, someone asked to see this recently and uh, I haven't brought it out in a while. This is the one that started it all for me. This is the um, cold steel master tanto. I uh, purchased this in 87 or 88 when I was in high school and uh, it's been next to my bed ever since. And uh, literally ever since, like this has always been the, this has always been the one. And I kept it in beautiful, pristine shape for a long time, used it only a couple of times camping. And then I made a Kydex sheath for it and just totally jacked up the finish. It's live and learn, right? Live and learn. But I wish it was on a different knife that I learned on. But anyway, so this is the Cold Steel Master Tanto, another part of rediscovering all these great knives I've surrounded myself with. And uh, it's so easy to be looking to the next thing. I'm trying to slow down and trying not to do that. So uh, I think that brings us to about the end of this edition, this supplemental edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, as always, I want to thank Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, always making things look great. And I also want to thank my dad for coming on and telling me that story, telling us all that story about it. picking up the Pachak knife in Uzbekistan and just barely making it out, <laughs> making out with it. So I love that. In any case, people, please uh, enjoy your week. Stay sane and uh, enjoy what you already have. I'm the Knife Junkie saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.